John Lanchester is the author of five novels, including The Wall, which he's here to discuss tonight. His previous novels include best-selling Debt to Pleasure and Capital, as well as several works of nonfiction, including IOU and How to Speak Money. His books, which have been translated into 25 languages, have won the Whitbread First Novel Prize, the Hawthorne Prize, and the E.M. Forrester Award of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. He is the contributing editor to the London Review of Books and a regular contributor to the New Yorker magazine. And as I said, he is here tonight to discuss this uh, brutal and fascinating new novel that uh, I think was even more timely than he thought when he began writing it, The Wall. Please join me in giving a warm town hall welcome to John Lanchester. Thank you very much, Ed. Thanks, everyone. For, uh, thanks for coming out on such a beautiful evening. Um, I'm going to begin without expert. I'm going to read three short passages and chat for a bit, and I'm going to start without explanation with the very opening of the book. It's cold on the wall. That's the first thing everybody tells you, and the first thing you notice when you're sent there. And it's the thing you think about all the time when you're on it. And it's the thing you remember when you're not there anymore. It's cold on the wall. You look for metaphors. It's cold as slate, as diamond, as the moon. Cold as charity. That's a good one. But you soon realize that the thing about the cold is that it isn't a metaphor. It isn't like anything else. It's nothing but a physical fact, this kind of cold anyway. Cold is cold, is cold. That's the first thing that hits you. This is a cold that's all about the place, like a permanent physical attribute of the location. The cold is one of its fundamental properties. It's intrinsic. So it hits you as a package the first time you go to the wall on the first day of your tour. You know that you're there for two years, you know that it's basically the same everywhere, as far as the geography goes, but that everything depends on what the people you are serving with will be like. You know there's nothing you can do about that. It's frightening, but also, in its way, a little bit freeing. No choice. Everything about the wall means you have no choice. Um, that... Uh, the opening of the book is actually where the book began for me. I, I wasn't planning to write The Wall. In, um, in fact, I was part of the way through a, a different, a completely different novel. Um, and I'm still part of the way through that other completely different novel. Um, and, but I began having a, a recurring dream um, in the sort of intermediate state between being awake and sleep. And um, I had this recurring dream over a series of nights and it began with this image of a figure standing on his own in the cold and the dark on a wall with the water on the other side. And I started to wonder who he was, who he is, who the figure was. And then realized that actually that was the wrong question, that the, the better question was what world is he living in? Because I, I could tell in, in the dream that it was a sort of, it's an altered world. Um, and I realized that I was imagining a world after catastrophic climate change. And the, um, I'd read enough about climate change to um, sort of have a mental model for what I was thinking about. I think it was a world with about four degrees centigrade, eight to nine degrees Fahrenheit of global warming. And if you look at that world, I mean, you can Google the map, maps of it. It's a thing of complete horror. Um, I know it's strange to say of a thing that, that I have imagined, but it's almost unimaginable because you have um, large parts of the planet that are currently densely settled. I mean, our, our planets, uh, you know, our ge the geography is different from what we think. Um, Madrid, Beijing and New York are all on the same latitude, and that's right in the band that in this four degree warmer, warmer world is essentially uninhabitable because you have um, dr droughts, floods, drowned cities, flooded coastlines, and changing, crucially, you have changing patterns of crop growth 
and you have massive systemic crop failures in exactly the places where we most need crops to grow to feed the planet. Um, and that I took in a sense as the, the premise of the book. Um, I've, I've been asked a few times about it if I was deliberately writing a dystopia or if it's in the kind of Orwell Huxley dystopian tradition. And for me, it, uh, I'm, I'm perfectly happy with people calling it a dystopia. I don't disavow that at all. But actually, in a way, I, I wonder if it's actually something slightly, um, uh, perhaps even grimmer, that it's, it, for me, writing it was almost more like a work of non-fiction, that I had one central premise. I had this premise about this catastrophic thing has happened. And then the process of writing it was about unfolding that premise, unpacking that premise, imagining what it would be like. It's less like the sort of standard thing you do in, work, in writing a work of fiction, which is you're imagining things, you're making things up, you're conjuring them into being. This was more like trying to think well, what, the, what the consequences would be. If this, then that, how would that work out? What would that be like? What would, what would happen as a result of that? And um, that's what took me to this image of the wall. Um, it's set in an island nation in the North Atlantic that uh, some astute and alert readers think may be a strong similarity to Britain. Um, it has to be in northern latitudes because more southerly latitudes are uninhabitable. And because of rising sea levels and because of the displaced, starving million desperate, starving and desperate millions of people fleeing now uninhabitable parts of the world. They've surrounded the whole island with a five metre high, 15 foot high concrete wall. And the concrete wall has two purposes. It's there partly as what's called, in engineering they call it a polder. A polder is what you have when the sea, the sea level on one side is higher than the land on the other side, um, which may sound exotic and unlikely, but um, they've been around for hundreds of years. The Netherlands has had polders for um, half a millennium. And in fact, the, a third of the land surface of the Netherlands is below sea level. So it's partly a polder and it's partly a fortification to keep people out. And the starving, desperate millions of people fleeing the other parts of the world um, are referred to by the citizens of this country. They just refer to them simply as the others. Every citizen of the country has to spend two years guarding the wall and standing guard on it to keep the others out. And uh, there's a very simple and very brutal rule, which is that if others get over the wall when you're, when you're on your tour of duty in your section of the wall, the others who get over it are faced a choice, offered a choice. They can be euthanized, they can be put put back out to sea again, or they can be turned into what's called help in the novel. And help are effectively slaves or indentured servants. It's effectively a slave society, though the people who live in it don't see it that way. And at the same time, the defenders who are on guard when the others got over are put to sea and become others themselves in a one-to-one -one exchange. If one of them gets over, one of you is put to sea. If 12 of them get over, 12 of you are put to sea. So it's a sort of brutally um, stark and bare version of life um, that I was imagining as something like a, a world war. You know, effectively, there's a, if you look at that map of a four degree warmer world, it's very difficult to imagine living through it um, without it being something like the order of change and the order of impact on every aspect of society that people go through during a a world war, except in this instance, the, you know, the enemy in the war is the climate. Um, so that was the, the premise of the book. And in an odd way, um, there was sort of, the curious thing was that if you told me I'd been thinking very deeply about the climate and had cooked up this novel in my head, I would have flatly denied it. Um, I did quite a lot of reading on the climate, uh, sort of, dozen years ago when I wrote a long piece about it. And I've sort of tried to keep up with the science. But uh, I wasn't aware that I was sort of actively thinking about it, mainly, I think, because I can't really bear to. I find climate change such an overwhelming 
um, overwhelming subject, it's very difficult to know how to process your emotions about it. It's difficult to know what to do about something so global and so um, so terrible, so catastrophic, and that leaves one on an individual level with such a, a diminished feeling of agency in terms of the well, what can I do? Um, but then it turned out that this book basically came in one go, came out as a dream, came out largely intact, beginning, middle, and end, because um, in, in a way that no other novel for me ever has. Um, I saw Garth Risk Hallberg, who's a wonderful young writer who I'd never met before. He came to reading in New York, and his line on that was that every writer gets one. You get one book come to you in a dream, so you just make the most of it. So I've used mine up now. Um, but I think actually the two things were linked. I think the fact that I sort of couldn't bear to think about climate change really consciously and the fact that my unconscious was actually energetically processing it, I think there's actually a direct causal link between, between the two things. Um, there's a thing that the French aphorist La Rochefoucauld said that I often think of about this. He said that death, like the sun, cannot be contemplated directly can't look straight at it. I think something similar is true about climate change. And I think the odd thing for me is that I find it much easier to think about now, much easier to think about what our responsibilities are, partly because I sort of processed it through this, through this dream. Now, when I was thinking about the consequences and what it would be like and the what-ifs, one of the things that occurred to me is that in the, some of the more accelerated and gloomy versions of uh, climate change within which it you get to this four degree warmer world within one or two generations, um, you would have a situation where people had effectively grown up with different planets. You'd have parents and children, grandparents and children who grew up on different planets. And that some of the, you know, we have, there are a lot of intergenerational tensions in our society at the moment. I thought that those could easily be hugely magnified by this, this thing about people having grown up in, with different realities. So the next passage I'm going to read is. A passage where Joseph Kavanagh, who's my main character, um, and the book follows him. That opening is his first arrival on the wall on day, day one of his two-year tour of duty. Um, and he takes us through the story. And this, this passage is, um, he's been on the wall for two weeks. And they do two weeks on, two weeks off. And he's just gone back to visit his parents for the first time. None of us can talk to our parents. By us, I mean my generation, people born after the change. You know that thing where you break up with someone and you say, it's not you, it's me. This is the opposite. It's not us, it's them. Everyone knows what the problem is. The diagnosis isn't hard. The diagnosis isn't even controversial. It's guilt, mass guilt generational guilt. The olds feel they irretrievably fucked up the world, then allowed us to be born into it. You know what? It's true. That's exactly what they did. They know it, we know it, everybody knows it. To make things worse, the olds didn't do time on the wall because there was no wall, because there'd been no change, so the wall wasn't needed. This means that the single most important and formative experience in the lives of my generation, the big thing that we all have in common, is something about which the olds have exactly no clue. The life advice, the knowing better, the back-in-our-day wisdom, which apparently was once a big part of the whole deal between parents and children, just doesn't work. Want to put me straight about what I'm doing wrong in my life, Grandad? No thanks. Why don't you travel back in time and unfuck up the world and then travel back here and maybe then we can talk? Now, um, one of the things I wanted to uh, convey in that passage was that, um, apart from the various things about intergenerational inequality and so on, was that Kavanagh um, is... You, you sometimes get these things in family arguments that someone tells the truth. So Kavanagh's completely telling the truth about his feelings, his perspective, his reality, how he sees things. You, someone can completely tell the truth, and yet what they're saying isn't really fair. 
there's a difference between truth and fairness. And someone's you know, deeply felt, deeply sincere truth isn't necessarily fair to the overall thing, you know, balance of balance of perspectives. And in that passage, I want to get the feeling that, you know, Kavanagh is completely telling the truth about how he sees it. And yet at the same time, you wonder, well, his poor old suburban parents sitting there on the sofa watching television, you know, he's attributing an awful lot of agency to them. Maybe they didn't actually directly, personally break the world. And that's part of the, one of the things you can do in a novel. You can suggest things through the gap between the narrator's perspective and our perspective. And Kavanagh does have a kind of moral or ethical blinkers on. He doesn't see the strangeness of the society he's living in. He doesn't see that it's effectively a slave state. There are lots of things he doesn't see about how different life would be for the others, what, what, their, what their reality is like, what their world is like. And then um, various things happen in the book to, in a sense, force him to see that different perspective. And so I'm going to finish by... Um, I'm going to go as far as I possibly can without giving away too many spoilers. Um, but I'm going to um, take, read up to a point where uh, the novel takes a turn. And it's a passage. Kavanagh is on duty on the wall at night. Um, and he's waiting for Mary, who's the cook, who's deep, deeply loved by all the other defenders on the wall because she basically brings them hot drinks and treats in the, in the middle of their long shift. And she's one of the things that breaks up the monotony of the 12-hour turn of duty that they're on. So he's been standing there all night, and it's just towards the end of his shift. There was a faint line at the horizon, dawn imminent, though the wind hadn't yet dropped, as it often does at daybreak. Mary got back on her bike and came over. I took a scan of the wall and the water and prepared her to give her my full attention for the next couple of minutes. Oof she said when she arrived. Hello, darling. I swear I'm getting more unfit the more I do this. That doesn't make sense, does it? It should be the other way around. Anyway, coffee and a biscuit, not in that order. Here, hold this. She reached into her shoulder bag and was holding out a packet of biscuits. I remember thinking, chocolate and orange jam, my favourite. I took them and put my rifle down on the bench, still within my arm's reach, as per the rules and unhooked my metal cup from the outside of my rucksack while she fiddled with the flask. I was glad it was coffee rather than tea, because although the tea tasted better, the coffee was more effective at keeping me awake. As she reached forward to pour it, I saw she'd spilt it over herself, though spilt it in a strange place, along her throat and the front top of her waterproof, and I thought, that's weird. I know she can be clumsy, but how did Mary manage to pour the coffee upwards, somehow to chuck it up over herself? She made a small noise, a bit like the oof when she'd stopped her bike, but quieter, more involuntary. She sounded surprised. She dropped the thermos flask and looked down at herself, and then all at once several things happened, simultaneously, but also slowly. The liquid was a strange colour, a strange texture, too. Mary was backlit, the lamp behind her, so I couldn't see properly. And I realised, yeah, it was the texture that was wrong, not the colour. The way the wetness was thick, but also moving too fast for a mere spill. It can't be coffee. Can she have spilt food on herself? But no, it's, it's a liquid. It's wrong for water. And it's not spilling, it's pumping. It's not being poured over her, it's coming out of her. There's only one thing it can be. It's blood. But how can it be blood? It's not a nosebleed. She hasn't thrown up blood on herself. That would be a very serious illness, one that had you throwing blood up on yourself. Anyway, it's not coming out of her mouth. It's coming from further down. It's pumping out of her. It, I swear, I can remember this whole train of thought, a line of argument running through my mind as if I was defending a PhD thesis or something. It can only have taken a tiny fraction of a second. And then I understood. Mary had been hit by a bullet or a knife or something similar. It was a very bad wound that she probably wouldn't survive. We were under attack. 
the others had come. Thank you very much. I'm so glad you read that section because that really was a moment reading the novel. That turn was so surprising and the literary choices there, I, I think everyone in the room could feel that were, that was a sh beautiful and shocking way of introducing violence so suddenly. Um, so I have a lot of questions I'm excited to get to and we're really excited to get to the audience questions but I don't wanna take up too much time. But I do wanna start kind of small on some sort of stylistic and literary questions about the book. Um, one is the descriptions of cold that you read at the beginning. They play a really strong part of the novel throughout the narrator's sort of coming to grips with the cold. Is that something that you have personal experience with or researched or how did you, how did you weave that in? If, if you'd asked me this um, three months ago, I would have said, no, I don't, I don't really get cold. Um, uh, I grew up in the tropics, I grew up in Hong Kong. And I actively like cold, you know, um, because it's a sort of change from um, the thing of my childhood. And also I think there's a, cold's easier to get away from because you can just put more clothes on, whereas heat is more claustrophobic. So, but I've always been interested in it intellectually. But then what happened, I started, I went on a diet um, I decided I need to lose some weight um, and lost about 15 pounds earlier this year. And I was cold all the time. I was absolutely freezing all the way through it. And my wife was very sort of, vindictive and jeering at me because she's I'm always the person who turns or I turn off all the heating off without telling her and I turn the thermostat down I turn the radiators off and then she's complaining about the cold and I say oh, I don't get it and I suddenly understood it's actually really unpleasant being cold um, but no that was a sort of pure intellectual thing that um, and the, the, the premise behind it was that it's to do with the thing I said about you know having read up on the science and it's in the back of my mind and Essentially what's happened um, is that the thing that keeps Northern Europe warm, especially Britain warm, is the Gulf Stream. Because if you look at where Britain is on the map, it's basically quite a long way up in Canada. And Canada has many, many virtues, but it's not famous for being warm. Um, and essentially what's happened in the world of the book is climate change has, uh, I think the, the posh name for it is the Arctic, or something recirculating current, mm -hmm. which we know as the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream, which is what keeps Northern Europe temperate, has switched off and has stopped working. The non-posh way of getting at that is if folks who saw the movie The Day After Tomorrow, um, which is based on that possibly dubious science in that film, but that idea of global warming leading to this massive freezing of the North Atlantic. And anyway, that's the premise. That's why everyone is co constantly freezing. Well, uh, yeah. I, I, the, the narrator Kavanaugh has this sort of very precise categorization of type one and type two cold that make this profound difference for the lives of the folks defending the wall. And that introduction of him as a narrator, which he read a little bit of, and then later the section where the sort of violence intercedes, both show that as a narrator, he's, he's an unusual narrator. He's very meth sort of analytical but he's not deeply reflective about the world. And I thought that was a fascinating choice. There were lots of moments in the novel where I wish that he was more curious about the world so that his curiosity could bring us uh, more sort of detail about the sort of history of how this all came to pass. But as I, as I got into that with him, I realized that was a brilliant choice because he had this sort of numbness to his reality that seemed almost like a evolved survival instinct. Was that oh, intentional? Uh, yeah, well, it was, he's grown up with it. It's, it his reality is entirely um, familiar and normal to him in the way that a child's reality is normal to a child. You often have that, um, you know, we acquire perspectives on our own childhood later in life, but as we're to a 10 year old, almost anything about their life is normal. And Kavanaugh is still in that sort of, um, he's a young man, he's 20, and he's still in that sort of bubble where he doesn't really have perspective on himself or perspective on the world around him. And because the, the changes in life have been so extreme, and as I said, it is like living through a world war, that quite a lot of what's happened is a kind of emotional shutting down and a kind of narrowing and a, a process focused on survival and endurance and, and, getting, and getting through it. So he's, he's not stupid and he is quite analytical, but he, he also, in a sense, has, 
has blinkers on, you know. But, but it's also linked to the fact that he, you know, this two-year period of life when they're on the wall, it is a, like a form of national service and a common theme. Uh, talked to lots of people who've done different versions of it, and you know, the main thing about that is just you just willing the time past. You know, it's this two-year section of life that's risky and dangerous and also monotonous, and he is just he's just trying to get through it. In addition to all the various background ideas of climate change that maybe were contributing to your dreamscape when you thought of this, also you were writing this novel around the centenary of the First World War, and I think that there's sort of evocations of world, the World War One novel of you know this this group of you know young British <laughs> soldiers stuck in this both boring and horrible situation together, and having this generational experience and this sort of cleavage with history. Yeah, and not and not just a. First World War. I mean, my, my grandparents were interned in a in a camp in the Second World War. They were interned in a camp in Hong Kong, Japanese run, a Japanese run, um, you know, concentration camp or internment camp. And um, my grandfather died before I was born, but my grandmother used to talk about it. And so some of the themes about um, endurance and the way that you get through difficult times like that by focusing on small things. Uh, and some of the stuff in it about hope being quite dangerous, that you need a, you need a kind of correctly calibrated dose of hope, sort of enough to stop you giving into despair, but actually not to think that some, you know, not to think you're going to get out tomorrow through some miraculous agency, because that can be quite dangerous. And so, you know, um, that's, in, that's in the book too. Uh, I, if you hadn't read it, I was going to ask you to read that section about generational, um, the generational uh, anger that the, the, the generation at the wall feels about their parents. It's very evocative for me of, uh, I think, a relatively recent kind of Twitter meme of um, sort of talking about boomers um, from, from younger people in a very pejorative sense, particularly around climate, you know, when talking about the radical action that needs to happen in the next 12 years, the recent UN IPCC report, there's this sort of similar tone of, oh, goddamn boomers uh, from the sort of millennial and younger generation, and we're seeing that. Is that something that you've experienced or, or thought about? Um, I have thought about it. I haven't experienced it. Um, <laughs> but uh, I do, I mean, I do think that the climate has the potential to make other of uh, the intergenerational things seem, you know, uh, relatively trivial and relatively marginal because in that accelerated version of things, the one or two generation onset thing, I do think it would be very difficult to avoid a direct sense of blame you know you broke the world I, I think I I see the intergenerational shift as an optimistic thing as well though um, because I think that the, the way that young people understand climate change not just as a factual reality but as an emergency is really important I think that's a real source of source of optimism it's not just some sort of back burner you know let's get around to fixing it one day thing that it's actually um, you know it's actually a crisis I think that's an important prelude to the you know the various changes and the various actions that we need because you know they um, you know polit we've, we end up with the politicians we deserve that's an unfortunate truth <laughs> that's an unfortunate fact about democracy and I think you know a new generation is going to demand different kinds of politician and and to, and to put it differently you know, I know we're in this horrible moment of um, denial, um, but the the way I try and you know encourage myself to think about it is that Bolsonaro and Trump are basically the last deniers that will ever be elected. That it's increasingly, increasingly not possible. Um, one of the um, one of the generational concerns of the characters in your novel is whether or not themselves to have children, to be, in, I think they're called breeders in the society. And actually, if you become a breeder, you get reprised from your time on the wall, but even still, people are reluctant to do it because of how fucked the world is. Uh, that's going on, I mean, I am childless and thinking about that too. There's a lot of folks who are having that conversation right now about, is it worth having children in this, even at this moment in the story? Of well, I was change. talking to Kate Yoda from Grist about this just before we came on. I mean, one of the things that I, I didn't, um, so there, you know, there, there are a number of things that are coincidental about the book, because Trump's wall, Trump, Trump was, it was, I started writing it early 2016, that's when I was having this dream. Um, 
I would have confidently gone out and bet the entire value of my house against Trump being the Republican nominee, let alone being president. So it's lucky there's no way of betting the value of your house on something like that. Um, um, so the uh, co you know Trump's wall and the wall in the title are co completely coincidental. Like, but I did think in terms of trends in our society that we were carrying on, carrying on in the direction we were going. One of the, those trend lines is to do with climate and the other was to do with trends in our society, our politics, our sort of turning turning inwards. And the, it's been strange and striking how many, and, how, and depressing, frankly, how many of the things that kind of along that dotted line projected into the future have continued to happen. One of them being Trump's war, one of them being Brexit, or, and you know, uh, there's a massive rise in these sort of nationalistic and turning inwards movements all across the developed world. You can see them in Europe, and yeah. then some of the climate stuff too. And um, the, the and there's a big um, you know the youth strike is exactly along the lines of the intergenerational thing that I was thinking about. And there's a new thing called birth strike, which is people making a big public point of refusing to have children. Um, so unfortunately, you know that we're still heading along that that version of the timeline that I was starting to think about when I started to write the book. Yeah. I mean, uh, another way of putting it is I wish I would, part of the point is, is part of the point of writing this book was to be wrong. You know, I want to be wrong about everything. I want to prevent it from happening by imagining it. But I'm, uh, unfortunately, I'm not being nearly wrong enough yet. <laughs> well, thank you for doing this work. I, 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 it, it strikes me that there haven't actually been that many novels and or movies or sort of big works of art and culture grappling with climate change and maybe it's part of it's so hard to r wrap your mind around i think it's hard to wrap your mind around i think there's a technical thing also that we're, we're sort of designed to we like we like um on a really deep almost genetic level we like stories about heroes and heroines who have agency who do things um, and I know it's sort of ho horrible Hollywood bullshit cliche about the hero's journey and all that, but there is a thing that we like about the main character does something, you know, causes something to change, becomes a slightly different person in the course of the journey, all that. It's very difficult to fit climate change into that, a thing that's so big, so structural, so systemic. I, it's a thing I came across when I was writing my last novel, Capital. Um, I was wanting to write a novel about about London, about changes in London, and realized that economics and finance came into it into a really big way, because that's what had changed the nature of the city that I was living in. And then the credit crunch happened, and um, I started getting interested in economics and finance and politics and writing about that. And I remember listening to, it was a firefighter, it was a firefighter's whose husband had just been laid off from his work, and it was their only income, and they had no money coming in. And I remember hearing on a, on a radio show saying, just explain to us what we did wrong. So I want to know, so what, what was the mistake we made? What was the thing that we should have done differently? And that really got to me, because I was thinking that the answer, the truthful answer was nothing. You didn't do anything wrong. You couldn't have done anything differently. It's not, it wasn't really up to you. It's a very, very difficult story to tell that. It's a difficult thing to hear, that lots of the most important things, perhaps it's more apparent in the modern world, are things with these colossal economic forces sweeping backwards and forwards, or things like climate change. That the traditional story about agency and, the, and a hero or heroine doing something change, it's actually really hard to, to, to fit that into the big things happening in the world around us. And I think that's a big part of the reason. Yeah, it does occur to me that there was a, some kind of deep pessimism in you, even beyond the dr addressing climate change, because when you dreamed the Kavanaugh on the wall, y you didn't imagine that he was there looking to help folks in boats coming and help create a sort of 
egalitarian utopia, you know, utopian island in the midst of this dystopia. So, um, I, I, what you said earlier about sort of reluctantly being in the dystopian um, tradition, I think is uh, is is worth placing this there. Although um, it it, it all, what you said it was almost you you feel in some ways it's almost grimmer than a traditional dystopia. Well, I, I mean, I make a distinction between the world of the book and what I think personally. Yeah. I mean. I suppose I would gently demur in saying it's very pessimistic because in real life people don't stand on the border holding hands and singing Hakuna Matata in welcome as refugees come towards them. I just noticed that's not what tends yeah. to happen. Um, no, but I think I think I have strong views about the subject of hope and despair in relation to this, and I think it'd be one thing if. Um, if what the sci science was saying was we're doomed. Um, but th that's not what the science is saying. And you mentioned the Katowice conference in Poland at the end of last year. And the, the, the consensus that came back from the International Panel on Climate Change was that we can hold the world to 1.5 degree of global warming, which is one, one degree since the Industrial Revolution, another 0.5. And that the difference between that and even two degrees of global warming is hundreds of millions of lives saved from catastrophic negative impacts. And as the UN says, every tenth of a degree matters. And I think the thing about that is that that's, it's really important to know that the science is saying this is a moment of hope. This is a moment when we can act. This is a moment when we kill, we can still affect radical change that prevents hundreds of millions, billions of lives from being f destroyed by climate change. So I think hope is actually really um, we're under a moral obligation to hope at the moment because if we if we don't hope we won't act and I think one of the one of the problems with the thing about that I was talking about earlier about the climate being this overwhelming thing that's very difficult to think about very difficult to get your head around um, is that you can go in this it's quite an easy sequence to it's unbearable um, you, you we we can we can feel nothing except despair there's nothing we can do. And I think despair is directly linked to inaction and it would be inaction that takes us to this world. Because one thing about the world and imagining in this book is we must not allow that to happen. We cannot allow that to become the, the reality of the world we've created. We're under a moral obligation to hope and a moral obligation to act on the basis of it. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. I, I should say that I guess my, my, my personal feeling after absorbing this book is not despair. It's definitely one of, of hope, and, and especially hope in because the novel is one of my favorite mediums. You are a great novelist and a great scholar of the novel, and um, to, to see one of the things that I think is so crucially necessary is art fiction that can mobilize consciousness to that stage at this moment because this the, you know the argument of the science and the argument of the politics is always there but without a sort of shift in consciousness and a prompt so uh, i'm glad to see you know great novelists tackling this well, i don't know about great novelists but i do i, I do deeply think that I mean, it's the thing james baldwin said that was um i thought it was a profound truth about the way Art works because I think sometimes it's too easy to say, you know, what novels should do politically. I think people are very free with their shoulds in the arts, too free in general. Uh, but Baldwin said that the main way that writers change the world is by changing the way people see the world. I think I think that's an important point. But th that those changes in how we see can look quite subtle and and they can look like internal processes, but actually I think they can have enormous, enormous consequences. And I think with a thing like, because I think there's a peculiarity about the climate thing that we're inviting, because our politics, let's face it, our politics is basically oriented around interest groups. We, we act in our interests one, one way or the other, and we acknowledge other people's interests. And it's very important that we, you know, we're constantly learning about new things we could, we should recognize, we should recognize rights and we should see people for who they are and see what their interests are and react to them. But we're talking about the rights and needs and moral demands of people who don't exist. You know, we're talking about taking radical action 
on behalf of and in the interests of unborn beings for the most part. That's quite a big ask. And we have to, we have, to have I think, quite a profound sh shift of our, our kind of default settings. I'm not sure our default settings are up to that. We, and that's why I think art and ways of reframing it and ways of telling the story and ways of imagining it differently really have a Baldwin-esque task to do in terms of changing how people see the world because I think that's an Im important preliminary in terms of, you know, doing something for the sake of people who ain't here. Yeah. Well, I do want to open it up to the audience for questions. I especially want to encourage any women in the audience to ask a first question because there's two blokes on stage. But as you all are thinking of questions, I will pr give one more um, since we have a distinguished scholar and thinker of British politics with us on stage today. Do you want to explain um, explain to this American audience what the hell is going on <laughs> with Brexit? And or is there going to be a no deal Brexit in a couple weeks? Or, or are you on this tour in America because you, you think you might expatriate? Well, it, it, I, I came up here from, um, I flew up from, I was in uh, Berkeley first and then Los Angeles, and it was really nice being in a place where marijuana is completely legal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's a joke, by the way. Um, no, I mean, I think the, the thing that is, I wasn't astonished by the referendum result. I thought it was going to be very close, you know, too close to call, and so I... I was less surprised by some. The thing that I am stupefied by is by this thing that if you, if you imagine a sort of version of Rip Van Winkle, 24th June 2016, the day after the referendum, he says, asks what the re result was, is told and f faints, goes into a coma. Wait, woke up this morning and he says, okay, what happened? Well, there's two ways of answering that. You can say, well, here's 500 newspaper headlines about, you know, the latest amazing plot twist and this has happened, that's happened, May said this, the EU said that, you know, astonishing turns and reversals in the narrative in Parliament, blah, blah, blah. Or the other way of answering that is to say nothing. And she says, no, 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 no. What I mean is what's happening about our future relationship with the EU, our most important trading partner, our immediate neighbour, the 400 million people on our doorstep whose GDP is eight times ours, who determines everything about you know, our future security. What's happened about that? Nothing. Don't know. No idea. I mean, that's the thing that actually defies belief, that there's two, whatever it is, two years, nine months of process. And... This isn't like one of the deals where the insiders, because I know people in politics and journalism and business and all that, and there's often a kind of insider's version of you know, where they tell you what's real. Oh, they have two drinks and then they tell you what the reality is. Nobody knows. Nobody's got a clue. And that is, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I have no words for that, really. It's sort of, you know, Watergate plus Vietnam plus a bay of pigs, plus trade wars are good and easy to win, you know. I mean, it's just the, the most outlandishly incompetent, f I think it's the biggest failure of governance. Plus Britain's Armando had. Iannucci style farce, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think basically what's happened is that it's, it's broken our politics because our, the parties are arranged along these fault lines to do with class affinity and Brexit just splits it down the middle. And I think the, the nub of the problem is there's 650 members of parliament. So to get a majority, you need 326. And the thing is that we voted remain or leave, but there's no such thing as leave. Leave has to mean something quite specific. It means affi affiliate membership of the European trade area, or it means we a complete separation. We trade on WTO terms, which no other country in the world does, or... I mean, there's a whole bunch of things it could mean. It doesn't tell you. And I think the root problem is that thing about 326 votes. I think if you start with the sentence, Britain's future with relationship with the EU should be, I don't think there is a way of completing that sentence that will get 326 votes in Parliament. I just, so it's a weird, there's no majority for any one outcome. And so I've no idea where it's going. It, it's genuinely bizarre. <laughs>
disturbing news from uh, from our friends in the United Kingdom. I um, mean, uh, I mean, and if I weren't British and I didn't live there, I'd think it was quite funny because it's such a giant cock up. <laughs> yes, and I, I apologize for my slight glee about it. It, it. it is wild, but it is one of these f cracking fault lines in the context of thinking about the 21st century and climate change and immigration and race and identity and yeah. internationalism that I is I mean, really I mean, stressful. I mean, there's two, two points I'd make that I think that have some relevance over here, if, if you forgive me. I think one is that norms don't work as well as we thought they did. You know, the idea that governing through their kind of norms of behavior, because there are norms of how parliament's meant to work that have manifestly failed. And I think some... In, in the United States, we don't know. You know, norms are still working just fine, yeah. so I can't... <laughs> And, I was gonna, and the part two of what I was going <laughs> to say was that, that something's happened about the importance of telling the truth in public life because a lot, an, an awful lot of the Leave campaign was based on things that were just flatly not true. And for, I don't know, quite know why, but that used to matter very deeply and now apparently it doesn't. So there's a microphone here and here. If anyone has a question, I invite them to come on up. Perfect, thank you. alumni from 85, Seattle U. Um, so when you f your first read sounded like Game of Thrones, the wall in the Game of Thrones. So that's what it reminded me of. But do you think your book is in the same genre as like 1984? I, um, I'm a great admirer of both books. Um, the, the one thing I would say about the, the different wall is um, George R. R. Martin's wall is 800 feet high and it's made of ice and magic. And mine's 15 feet high, and, no it's, made, and it's made of concrete. Oh, okay. um, I did, um, I mean, funny enough, one of the places he drew inspiration from was Hadrian's Wall, and I, I've always found Hadrian's Wall very moving, the, particularly the, now that the archaeology tells us more about the lives of the soldiers. We know who they were, and they're these really far-flung bits of the Roman Empire. Some of them are from modern-day Syria, some of them from modern-day North Africa, some of them from modern-day Belgium. And they must have had such an extraordinary feeling you know, standing on this thing, which is ab actually about the same height as my wall, about 15 feet high, just looking into, you know, looking into what's now Scotland, you know, waiting for hairy Picts to come and throw spears at them. There must have been such a strong sense of being just at the limit, just at, at the end of the w at the limit of the world. No, the thing about Orwell, um, I didn't, I didn't have uh, it in my head while I was writing, um, but I can, you know, people have mentioned similarities through the dystopian thing. I think um, one of the things that's very vivid, I reread it well after finishing it, um, uh, is what a wartime book it is. You know, it has this incredibly powerful feeling of, um, you, you know, you can sort of sense the Second World War in Orwell's book. Not, I mean, partly because it comes as close as any book possibly could to actually smelling of boiled cabbage. You know, they're always eating boiled cabbage and it kind of, and that sense of privation and restraint and life being kind of narrowed down and pinched and based on survival and just getting through things. Um, I think that's a, I think I was imagining a warlike atmosphere of the sort that Orwell had, had lived through. Um, but I do think there's a distinction there because I think Orwell was writing about something that had, in a sense, already happened. Orwell had seen totalitarianism. He'd, and he understood the totalitarian mentality at first hand. And he was, he was sort of giving a warning about this exists and it, and it can come to you, which I think is a slightly different thing from, a, you know, if we carry on the way we're going which is actually more like Huxley. A Brave New World is more of a warning right. about where we, could, where we could travel. Thank you. Also, Thank do you, you think your book could be turned into a movie? I, don't, I mean, I, I, I never, I'd written my first three novels, um, various people, they were optioned and I never thought it could be done. I never thought it could be done. Um, so in a sense, the options were in bad faith, I suppose. Uh, my last novel, Capital, they d was the first time I wrote something and someone said, you, you know, that could be adapted. And I thought, oh yeah, it could. Someone could do that. And it was, and the BBC did it as a TV, a miniseries. And I feel that about it's this. It's a really charming uh, adaptation. Oh, thank yeah. you. Um, 
though with a super weird postscript because it won an international Emmy Award, which is like the Emmy Awards, except no one's ever heard of them because they're for international thing. And um, the award ceremony was at the Hilton in New York, and the, the producer went up to accept it, went up to the podium, and it was literally the same podium from which Trump had made his acceptance speech the two nights before. He said Trump won on the Tuesday and the Emmys were on the Thursday. So he said it was the strangest atmosphere of every, any room he'd ever been in because there's all these hard-bitten TV executives just kind of completely numb in shock. That was a weird postscript. But this one, I, I, like, as with Capital, I can imagine someone adapting it, I think. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. This could make quite a good play. Uh, yeah. <laughs> we need to be creative, but I have thoughts. Uh, other questions? You can. Are there any uh, questions you would w like to be asked before we uh, close? Our uh, I'll give you one. Uh, I was just down visiting with my brother in Sarasota, Florida, and uh, went along the waterfront there, and they're building these huge high-rise really expensive condos down there. And if you've looked at the maps of what's likely to happen to Florida, um, it's basically going to disappear, uh, which is fine with me. But um, uh, why are people so boneheaded that we're continuing to invest smart people with money in, in things that just seem like they are doomed? I, I think it's because we so don't want it to be true. I think it's one of those things that we deeply, viscerally reject, imaginatively. We d and and I, I get it, by the way. I, I know people get appalled and angry at, at climate deniers, but, and I don't, I mean, I think uh, I'm certain they're wrong, but I do really understand the impulse to not want it to be true. Um, uh, the, I mean, why, why wouldn't we want it not to be true? But unfortunately, there's then you go. There's quite a closed loop between wanting it not to be true and acting as if it isn't true, which is a very, very different thing. So yeah, I think um, there's a, a lot of things that we're doing. Um, uh, you know, I mean, the thing you see in Britain is houses being built on f you know floodplains constantly, all, all the time. Um, I think we, you know there's certain kinds of risk that we we seem quite bad. We seem kind of hardwired at not. Um, acknowledging certain sort of things. If you ever go to Naples, you see houses, every, when you go back, they're going further and further up the side of Mount Vesuvius. You effectively have these suburbs kind of creeping up the sides of a semi-dormant volcano. And it's, it looks like the, you know, the absolute picture and definition of complete madness, but that's because you know, it, it hasn't erupted in the last, you know, it hasn't erupted in living memory, therefore it's never going to happen. We're, we're really bad at, um, at certain sorts of, uh, I suppose it comes down to something as simple as, you know, pr probabilities. You know, we, we just sort of, if we want it, we, we act on the thing we want to be true. Well, um, if that's, no more questions, I think that's a nice, spot to end on. <laughs> Again, there's a lot of grimness in here, but, but uh, as a work, I think a lot of hope. Um, thank you so much, John Lanchester. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. As I said at the top, Elliot Bay Books is set up in the lobby, and John will be out in just a minute to sign. Thanks again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much.